Welcome to Triage Cancer's webinar, Beyond Medicine, Your Community and Your Health. My name is Melissa Salomon. I'm a staff attorney here at Triage Cancer. And if you're interested in learning more about me, you can do that on our website to see my bio. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the social determinants of health and how various aspects of your community can impact your health. It will also provide some ideas for ways to make changes or access rights that are available to you that might help improve some aspects of social determinants of health. Now, this is part two of the series. I spoke two weeks ago about housing in your health. That webinar is available to view on our website now. I'm gonna be talking about some of the same concepts today, but I'm gonna be going more in depth on the ones that aren't housing related. And again, before we talk about social determinants of health or health equity, I wanna remind everyone about the concept of equity and how it differs from equality. We often hear these terms used interchangeably or that we should strive for equality, but this image really helps us understand why that's not true and why factors that we're gonna be talking about today can impact people in different ways. So equality means providing the same to all, whereas equity means recognizing that we don't all start from the same place and we need to acknowledge and make adjustments for imbalances. When we talk about equity, what we're talking about is fairness and justice. So to visualize that, what we have here are three individuals who are trying to watch a baseball game. And on the left, they're being provided equal opportunity in the form of one box to each of them. But the outcome is unfair. The tall individual is towering over the fence. The guy in the middle is able to see over perfectly. And the little guy, he only gets to see the back side of that fence. But when we look to the image on the right, where we see that the boxes have been distributed equitably, all three of these individuals are able to watch the game. Now the outcome is fair and just. All three of these individuals get to see the game. I want you to keep this image in the back of your mind while I talk about health equity and social determinants of health. Because when we get to how populations are impacted differently, we can understand better why equal treatment just won't solve the problem. Health equity has become a bit of a buzzword over the past few years, but what exactly is it? Well, health equity is the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to attain their highest level of health. So essentially, everyone gets the chance to be the healthiest that they can be. To get to health equity, we have to recognize that our health is not impacted only by our biological makeup and our own behaviors, but also by other outside factors, many of which we cannot change on our own. Health is a fundamental human right, and the right to health means that we need to figure out where the inequities are and get rid of them so that everyone has the chance to be the healthiest they can be. Health disparities are preventable differences in health that impact populations who are disadvantaged because of their social or economic status, because of their geographic location, and because of their environment. If we wanna succeed at reaching health equity, we have to ha have ongoing efforts at the societal level to decrease health disparity. We also have to allow those who are victims of discrimination and other injustices to reach their optimal health. Social determinants of health are the conditions and the environments where we live, work, and play that impact our health. There are some different ways to think about them, but I'm gonna use the framework used by the US Department of Health and Human Services, which breaks them into five categories for their Healthy People 2030 campaign. Those five categories are education, access, and quality, healthcare and quality, neighborhood and built environment, social and community context, and economic stability. I'm gonna discuss each of them. And along the way, talk to you about how you can make changes in your situation that might help reduce the impact from any of these social determinants of health. 
The social determinants of health are all intertwined or overlapping, so they tend to impact each other in some way. If you make improvements in one area, it may relieve concerns in another as well. And there are three major ways in which social determinants of health may impact different populations differently. These can be viewed as points of intervention or places where we can make changes to address social determinants of health and lessen their impact. The first is a difference in exposure. So certain population groups, because of economics, geography, or other factors, are more likely than others to encounter a particular health risk. People in poverty, for example, are likely to be exposed to higher levels of stress, economic uncertainty, and unhealthy conditions than wealthier individuals are. There are differences in vulnerability. Because of their poverty, their exposure to stress and uncertainty or other factors, those same population groups might find themselves more vulnerable than others to health problems. The inability to pay for regular medical care, for treatment, increases the possibility of chronic illness. There are also differences in consequences. So when there are differences in wealth, social standing, connectedness, and other factors, it can lead to very different outcomes where health issues are concerned. For a middle or upper class family, if they have a minor health problem, they might miss a few days of work and have to pay some money for treatment. It's likely just an annoyance to them. For a poor family, it might be the difference between a roof over their heads and homelessness, or between children attending school or dropping and dropping out to go to work. Discrimination, high stress levels, employment conditions, and other factors can lead to disparities in health and health care among different groups. So the first category in the Healthy Humans 2030 campaign is education, access, and quality. When we talk about access to education, we're talking about the ability for children to attend early childhood education programs like Head Start and Preschool, as well as the standard primary and secondary schooling from kindergarten through 12th grade. And education beyond secondary school, whether that's trade school, traditional four-year college, or going on to get an advanced degree. And then it's not only about having access to that education, but the quality of the schooling as well. K-12 public school is technically available to all children in the United States for free. But access and quality vary based on a variety of factors, which can impact kids' health into adulthood. Districts are not required to offer preschool to all students, though there are some that do. Studies do show that children who attend early childhood education programs, like preschool or Head Start, engage in less risky behaviors like smoking, binge drinking, and illegal drug use when they're young adults, and they have better physical and mental health in adulthood. Studies have found that the higher the level of education you have, the more likely you are to live a longer, healthier life. In fact, somebody with a high school diploma will actually live on average seven years longer than someone who didn't graduate. If you do not have a high school diploma, you're nearly three times more likely to be uninsured than someone with a college degree and much more likely to avoid health care because of the cost. Unfortunately, if you didn't finish high school, you're also more likely to have multiple chronic illnesses, things like heart disease, cancer, diabetes, stroke, and arthritis. Higher levels of education tend to be linked to living a healthier lifestyle. And why is that? Well, higher levels of education are often linked to improved financial stability, better access to good health insurance, and in good turn, health, and in turn good health care, as well as better housing options. Education also gives people the tools they need to navigate the system and analyze their own situation to make decisions that positively impact their health. Education is considered the great equalizer, but right now, educational equity is a long way off. Improving access and quality will put children in a better position to ultimately improve health 
and well-being into adulthood. One of the outcomes attributed to lower education levels and poor quality education is low literacy levels. When we're talking about literacy, we're talking about reading, writing, and the ability to compute or solve problems. Basic skills, which are really necessary to navigate our increasingly complex world. Now, there are many different statistics out there about literacy rates in the US. In 2020, data released by the US Department of Education indicated that about half of the American adult population reads and writes at or below the sixth grade level. And one in five people are unable to fill out basic forms. Low literacy is a direct barrier to health. It prevents access to health information and keeps people from fully understanding their situations and the options they have available. It impacts their ability to properly use medications, it leads to fewer preventative visits. And then there's also a link between limited literacy and chronic conditions, including diabetes and cancer. Lower literacy levels also lead to increases in unemployment and a greater likelihood of a low wage job. What we saw during the pandemic was that people with lower literacy rates were more likely to go on unemployment because of the nature of their job while those with higher literacy and education levels were more likely to be able to pivot to a, a remote position. There's also a much greater chance of incarceration for individuals with low literacy. So when we're thinking about materials, resources, and instructions that are shared with patients, those should be easily understood. And that really means that they should be at the sixth grade reading level and not complex and filled with medical jargon. We also need to push for better reading interventions during those early education years so that everyone has a chance to reach higher levels of literacy. Sometimes when students are dealing with a cancer diagnosis, their symptoms or side effects from treatment impact their access to education. There are some laws that protect students and these can be used to overcome some of the barriers that are also related to the social determinants of health. I wanna talk a little bit more about some of the education rights that students have from preschool through grad school. So we know that children, teens, and young adults tend to be diagnosed with cancers that are different than those that we see in adults. They sometimes also have different treatments and different side effects. Side effects might depend on what how old the student is when they actually receive the treatment. And they might have short-term side effects, long-term side effects, or even late-term side effects that don't show up till treatment's over. Students, their parents, their teachers, and their administrators should be aware that they might experience changes over time. And these side effects might impact their education. So they might experience some of the typical things like fatigue and nausea, but they might have some other issues because their brains are still forming. So the treatment could impact academic skills like handwriting, spelling, reading, vocabulary, math. It can also impact cognitive and executive functioning, which includes things like concentration, attention span, ability to complete tasks on time, memory, processing, planning, organizing, problem solving. It also impacts social skills. A useful test to figure out how someone's brain is functioning is a neuropsychological evaluation. And that can sometimes be done before treatment, um, but it's not common that it is. And of course, there are also barriers to getting this test, like costs and availability. But when kids are experiencing side effects and they impact their education, there are three laws that provide protection. They're all different, but they overlap in some way. So first, we have the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or the IDEA, and that requires public to provide a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive This means that students with disabilities are supposed to be integrated with their peers. They can't be sent to a different class or a different school. There's a way to keep them in the general education classroom or in their regular school. 
It applies to students from three to 21. And in order to qualify for services, the student has to meet the criteria for one of these 13 disability categories as defined by the IDEA. This is a very limited definition of disability. For students who have a cancer diagnosis, depending on how they're impacted, they may be able to qualify under specific learning disability, traumatic brain injury, or other health impairment. If you want more information about this, um, the Department of Education has a website on IDEA with useful information. Under the IDEA, the first thing a parent can do to get services for their child is to request an evaluation for special education services. And if the student qualifies, they'll have access to an individualized education plan, or an IEP. It's helpful to remember that that request is supposed to come from a parent, not an, uh, or a caregiver, not a healthcare professional. Once the evaluation request has been made, there will be a series of meetings to help respond to the request, to plan and carry out an evaluation, if appropriate and then create a plan. The plan then has to be reviewed and updated annually, and the student gets re-evaluated every three years. The IEP is gonna include goals that the student's working on and services they'll receive to achieve those goals. There are also accommodations available, both in the school setting and in testing scenarios. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 is a civil rights act that prohibits discrimination based on disability in programs receiving federal funding. And because of that, it applies to all K-12 schools and college and graduate schools that receive federal funding. So if a school takes federal loans, this law applies to them. Section 504 has a broader definition of disability than the IDEA. It applies to students with physical or mental impairments with, which substantially limit one or more major life activities. Major life activities include things like walking, talking, reading, writing, learning, concentrating, communicating, but also major bodily functions. It also protects students who have a record of having such an impairment and students who are perceived as having such an impairment. Students with a disability under the Section 504 can get a 504 plan which is a plan that provides them with accommodations at school. And then there's the Americans with Disabilities Act, or the ADA, which protects individuals with disabilities from discrimination, and students can access accommodations through this law as well. The ADA doesn't apply to religious schools, but it does apply to other private schools. When we're thinking about accommodations in the school setting, those are changes to the way that things are typically done so that a student can access their education. We can divide them into three types of accommodations. A modification in space, things like sitting in a specific seat, having access to an elevator, maybe a change in housing if they live in student housing. It can be about modifying a schedule, things like a flexible schedule, additional breaks, or the ability to change classes when no one else is in the hallway. Another, and then the last category is other options. And that's things like using technology, maybe getting somebody to take notes for you instead of having to take them yourself, being able to record classes, a change in the way that tests are administered. This list is not exhaustive. There are lots of options out there. And if you're thinking about asking for accommodations, the first thing you wanna consider is whether the school has to accommodate you. Most of them do. But remember that accommodations have to be reasonable and they have to be effective. And you can get more than one. There's not a limit. Also remember that your needs might change over time so that you may need to change your accommodations as you go through treatment. When thinking about accommodations at school, these are some helpful questions to ask yourself. We have this checklist available on our website as a checklist to reasonable accommodations. 
And it helps just think about what you should be asking and considering when you're asking for a reasonable accommodation. It's really important that you do get that accommodation in writing because that is something that you can use to ensure that you actually get access. When students are diagnosed with cancer and their families are trying to navigate the landscape at school, it can be really overwhelming, especially when families are dealing with some of the other burdens that we're discussing today. Students are allowed to bring support people with them to these meetings. And the individuals might be there to advocate for them on their behalf, if necessary, but often just the act of bringing someone with you, whether that's an advocate or someone from your healthcare team, can actually help move the conversation forward. So if you're interested in finding an advocate, you can look to the state or a local legal aid, but it's also helpful for healthcare professionals to attend these meetings, both to provide support to patient families and to provide insights about what accommodations could be useful. And because the challenge of transitioning back to school after or during treatment is so difficult, some hospitals have actually developed what they're calling re-entry programs to help students with the transition. Two examples of that are Stony Brook Children's Hospital and St. Jude's Children's Hospital. We also have developed some resources that can be helpful when you're trying to think through accommodations at school. We have an education mo module on our toolkit website at cancerfinances.org. And then you may want to check out some of our resources related to reasonable accommodations at work, which can sometimes be helpful in thinking through accommodations in the school setting as well. So the next social determinant of health category has to do with access to health care. Many people face barriers that prevent or limit access to needed health care services, which can increase the risk of poor health outcomes and health disparities. Access to health care is defined as having timely access to the use of personal health services to achieve the best possible health outcomes. When there's no access, there's no screening, no one to turn to when you have concerns, and nowhere to access treatment. And then there's the quality of that available health care. Even if someone has access to health care, when the care they have is poor, then they're less likely to have the same outcome as someone who has access to the latest and greatest in care. And a person's ability to understand the information that's presented to them and make decisions based on that information is what we call health literacy. Low levels of health literacy also impact access to care. These are some of the most common barriers to accessing quality health care. So many people have insufficient health insurance coverage, and that might be because they're uninsured or underinsured, usually because of cost. And that leads them to skip care including important screenings like annual visits, preventative screening, dental checkup, and child well checks. And all of those are actually really important ways that health concerns can be identified. In rural communities, we often see access as limited because there's an ever decreasing number of facilities that um, are available. Specialization by the providers that are there. And what that means for patients is that they have to travel far distances to get adequate care. Unfortunately, there are just not enough medical professionals out there to meet the need. And while this shortage affects everyone, it really hits hardest in those rural communities with less access to care. And then even in more urban and suburban communities where care may be available in the community, there's an inability to access that care because of barriers like cost, a lack of transportation, or few providers who will accept certain types of health insurance like Medicaid. There are also work-related barriers like timing. 
When you have to choose between going in for a doctor's appointment to maintain or working to maintain your housing or food stability, you're unlikely to choose a doctor, especially if you're not experiencing any symptoms. We also see that stigma and bias exist across the medical community, including discrimination based on race, immigration, sex, gender, and sexual orientation. Stigma hampers access to care, affecting patients' willingness and ability to seek support when they need it most. Even unintentional bias from clinicians and staff based on information and outdated medical materials actually makes patients feel unwelcome and they may be reluctant to return. And then there are language barriers. One in five households speaks a language other than English at home. Studies show that those who have lim limited English proficiency, so those who are not fluent in English, are less likely to have a primary care doctor or to have had an annual preventative visit. When they do go to the doctor, the quality of care that they receive tends to be lower. There are often not enough qualified interpreters available, making communication difficult or impossible, or leading to the reliance on untrained family members or friends who accompany a patient to their appointment. There are also few patient resources available in, English, in languages other than English. And medical professionals tend to lack training in culturally appropriate practices, which hinders the relationship between the provider and the patient. There are some ways that we can overcome these barriers. The lifetime health consequences of missing preventative and screening appointments has actually prompted some health systems to actually provide services to uninsured or underinsured patients. There's also the opportunity to expand Medicaid across the country. Telehealth systems, mobile clinics, shuttle systems, and after hour provider availability, availability can make meet people where they are. This helps resolve issues related to transportation, time, and provider availability in those areas where there's a lack of access to healthcare. Patients also need to be educated about where care is available and how to use it. This can help direct patients away from busy emergency rooms and to primary care And then we also want to improve cultural responsiveness. We need materials that are culturally and linguistically appropriate. And we need to be offering interpretive services by qualified, trained interpreters to anyone who needs one. We should never be relying on friends or family and absolutely never relying on children to provide interpretation services. So when we're thinking about expanding access to health insurance coverage, it may be helpful to know that in the U.S. there are only three places where we get it. We're either getting it directly from an insurance company, like when you buy insurance in the marketplace or through a broker. Some people get it through the government, through Medicare, Medicaid, military veterans plans, or through a state or local program. And then about 50% of people in the US get their health insurance coverage through their employer. I'm gonna focus on Medicaid because that's the place where individuals who are uninsured and have low incomes may be able to access immediate coverage, or at least fairly immediate. So Medicaid is a federal program that provides free or low cost health insurance. And as of September, 2022, almost 91 million people were on Medicaid or CHIP, which is the program that offers health insurance to kids. 
states run the Medicaid program for their state. And unfortunately, when we're talking about Medicaid, it's very state specific. So it's important to know that I'm gonna give you some general information about Medicaid, but how the program works exactly in your state is gonna depend on where you live. The federal government does create some ground rules that every state has to comply with. But states have flexibility in how they design their program. They can also apply for a waiver from the federal government to be able to customize their program. Because of all these differences, it can be really difficult to understand how to navigate the program, both for individuals who want to access them and for people who are trying to help them access them. One of the major differences among states is that it's not actually called Medicaid in all states. So many states have come up with different names for it, like Apple Health in Washington and Husky Health in Connecticut and TenCare in Tennessee. And then individuals in states may actually know it by a different name if they have a managed care plan through Medicaid. Up until the Affordable Care Act or the ACA went into effect, in order to be eligible for Medicaid, you had to have a low income, low resource level, and qualify by walking through one of the doors here under that green umbrella. So you had to be age, blind, or disabled, be in need of breast or cervical cancer treatment, be a minor child or a person with a minor child in your care, or be pregnant or recently postpartum. The ACA expanded Medicaid to create a new door that allows people to walk through, and that's for adults with low incomes. And they were previously unable to access Medicaid because they didn't have a door to walk through. So the Affordable Care Act created this fifth door based just on income. For individuals who have an income at or below 138% of federal poverty level, which in 2023 is $20,120.40. And that's for a household home. If they have that or below, they're eligible for Medicaid. There's no asset or resource test to be able to walk through this door. The ACA had made it mandatory to expand Medicaid in all states. And the Supreme Court came along and in its first decision about the ACA said, nope, we're going to make it voluntary. So each state now gets to decide whether they want to offer expanded Medicaid. And this is what it looks like as of today. The states on the left have chosen to expand access to their programs, and the states on the right have not. The states on the right represent about three to five million people who would have gotten access to coverage, but haven't because their states have chosen not to expand. Now, this slide changes really frequently, and we have North Carolina in red because their state legislature recently approved Medicaid expansion, yay, and the law was signed into law by the government, governor, but now they need to approve the budget that would make it a reality. So we really hope to see North Carolina move over to that left column soon. Now, in addition to the doors I described, there are also some state-specific doors that may be available to you. These include programs like Medicaid buy-in, where you have to pay a certain amount of money towards your medical expenses before Medicaid coverage kicks in, and share of cost programs for medically needy individuals. Again, these are gonna vary by state. So even if you think you don't qualify for Medicaid, it's useful to explore what options are available because there might be a program that you didn't know about. To find out more, you can check out your, um, check with your state Medicaid agency. We do have links to each of those on our state resources page. We also have a resource hub on our website that's dedicated to Medicaid. So that's a good place to start as well. One of the great things about Medicaid is that applications are accepted all year round. So as soon as you become eligible for Medicaid, you can apply and your coverage is typically gonna begin either on the day you were applied or in some places back to the first day of the month that you applied. 
even though it might take some time to actually process the application. You may also be able to access retroactive coverage up to three months back. And that's if you would have been eligible at the time you applied. Again, this is gonna be state specific. You can start an application by going to healthcare.gov or straight to your state agency. At Triage Cancer, we think it's really important for you to know all of your options because you may actually have more than you think. So maybe you're eligible for Medicaid. Maybe you're eligible for another type of health insurance that you didn't know about. We have lots of resources on our site that can help you figure out what's available to you. And if it turns out that you're not eligible or you cannot access health insurance, but you do need care, there are still a few available options, though they're gonna be pretty limited. There are federally funded health centers and federally qualified health centers or FQHCs. There are community clinics. And then though not ideal, you can get care in an emergency department. And some hospitals have ability to pay programs, charity care programs or financial assistance that's available. So the healthcare options you have are typically going to depend where you live. But where you live itself also has an impact on your health. So neighborhood and built environment is about both the outside space, including neighborhoods, roads, sidewalks, green spaces, and, and then also the structures in those spaces. Your zip code is now understood to be the, a stronger predictor of your health than your genetic code. The safety of your neighborhood and where you spend your time also falls into this section. So that's gonna include things like the level of violence and your comfort in being able to move about your neighborhood, which impacts your ability to access fresh air, spaces for physical activity, and your mental and physical well-being. There are also safety concerns related to a lack of infrastructure that promote healthy outdoor activity, like when there's busy roads and no sidewalks. The actual location of the neighborhood is a factor as well. So are you living somewhere where you're exposed to higher pollution in the air and the land and the water? And then of course, there are also concerns related to the safety of the structures themselves and their quality. Our housing is also included here. And our housing can be broken up into four different pathways that impact our health. So there's the stability, which can range from homelessness and housing instability on one end of a spectrum to secure stable housing on the other. When housing is insecure, it makes it hard for people to access healthcare and to appropriately follow treatment recommendations and prescription instructions. Homelessness and housing instability lead to poor health outcomes and premature death. When individuals do not have a stable home to live in, there may be concerns about the quality and the safety of the home. Sorry, when they do have a stable home to live in, if they're gonna be concerned about quality and safety. So there are substandard housing and risks associated with older homes, which can impact your health. Um, things like exposure to lead, asbestos, radon, mold. Neighborhoods where low-income people live are commonly located in areas that are made up of homes that were built before the 1980s, where those concerns are more common. And property owners often take advantage of the vulnerability of their tenants, and they don't always keep those homes up to code. They're often exposed to these risks that are associated with older homes, and those can have a long lasting impact on their health. They're also often compelled to live in these conditions because there's a lack of affordable housing in the US and landlords know that they can get new people to move in if the current tenant moves out. Housing is considered to be unaffordable or cost burdened, which is another issue for people, when the household spends more than 30% of their income on housing. When people are burdened by housing costs, 
They have less money to spend on healthcare and other essentials like nutritious foods. In 2021, there were over 19 million U.S. renters who were cost burdened. And the neighborhood where the home is located also impacts our health. So studies show that people from racial and ethnic minority groups are more likely to have difficulty finding affordable and quality housing. In neighborhoods where populations with low income and minority populations live, are more likely to experience harmful conditions like poor air quality and higher rates of pollution. These neighborhoods are also less likely to have health-promoting conditions like sidewalks, bike lanes, and parks. The Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, has programs available to help people with both discrimination in housing and accessing it. HUD's website has several tools that are useful. They can help you find local options and resources. They, can all, they also offer um, counselors, which can help you walk through programs and eligibility criteria for them. If you have questions related to housing, I suggest watching part one of the series, where I go in depth on concerns related to housing and tips on how to access and improve your health. We also have some resources available on our website, including a module at cancerfinances.org. So where we live impacts our health, and it can impact what our community experiences. So now we're going to shift into social and community context. And that's really about relationships which are the social ties we have to each other and our community. This includes our individual relationships with our family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors, as well as our civic participation, workplace conditions, the impact of incarceration, and the effects of discrimination. Well, having no or few relationships or chances for engagement is really bad for your health, Positive experiences can actually undo some of the negative impact from other social determinants. I think this is huge because it can make changes to some aspects of our social and community context at the individual level, and we can push for collectively, we can push for change at the societal level. <clears throat> so relationships are important for physical and mental health. They're conceptualized through terms like social cohesion, social capital, social networks, and social support. And even though those terms are complicated sounding, it boils down to the idea that you have a community or a group of people to whom you feel connected and a sense of belonging. The community shares resources like information about a job opportunity or the proverbial cup of sugar. They also provide support which might be emotional support, like helping you get through a tough time, or it might be structural support, like giving you a ride somewhere. And through these actions and shared experiences, our connection to each other gets stronger. This community you belong to might be the neighborhood where you live, or it might be through a church, or another group that you belong to, whether that's formal or informal. Where there are these strong community ties, people have better health. So neighborhoods with a strong sense of community have lower neighborhood violence and better access to the things that we need to keep in good health, like medical care, healthy food options, and places to exercise. Social support can be extremely helpful and can actually protect people from the harmful physical and mental effects that come from discrimination. This really reminds me of that proverb that it takes a village to raise a child. Because the idea here is that where there's strong community, it provides the support needed to raise healthy, happy kids. There's also the idea of social contagion. And this is where we get influenced either positively or negatively by our community. It might lead to healthy habits like eating a healthy diet and exercising but it can also lead to unhealthy habits like smoking and drinking. 
The idea is similar to peer pressure, but without the pressure part. No one's coercing anyone to act in a certain way. We just pick up the habits of our network. And so the community you belong to can actually influence your health just by being a member. And whereas feeling like you belong to a community can have a really strong, positive influence on our health, social isolation and loneliness are health harming. So social isolation is when we have little interaction with others. And loneliness is the feeling of distress or discomfort that comes from feeling like you don't belong to a community. This might happen even if you have interactions with others, but those interactions do not help you feel part of the community. And it's often associated with discrimination. So isolation and loneliness are associated with increased risk of premature death, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and immune and respiratory illnesses. It also puts people at increased risk of dementia, stroke, and cognitive decline. Loneliness is associated with higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. And not surprisingly, during the pandemic, Americans reported higher rates of loneliness because of social distancing. We also know that immigrant populations, LGBTQ populations, and older Americans are all at a higher risk from loneliness. People are generally socially social by nature, and high quality social relationships can help them live longer, healthier lives. So how do we deal with loneliness? Here's some ways that you might be able to find more interaction. So you can find an activity that you enjoy or learn something new. You might learn to have fun. You might pe meet people who are like you and like to do the same things that you do. To try and find new things to do, you can look at places like meetup.com, where there are often get-togethers based on people's interests. If you use social media, there are often local Facebook groups for different types of activities and community events. Sometimes retailers have group events. So if you're interested in home improvement projects, Home Depot and Lowe's offer classes. If you like crafting, Michael's has classes. Small businesses, which are dedicated to specific sectors, also sometimes have group events. So things like a yarn store has knitting and crocheting groups. Bookstores sometimes have book clubs. And running stores have running groups. And speaking of running, exercise is a great way to decrease stress. It also boosts your mood and increases energy. Obviously, you need to make sure that you're following the advice of your doctors. But if you're cleared to exercise, you may be able to find local walking groups or join a yoga studio. Depending on where you live, there are sometimes one-off events that you can attend as well. Things like yoga in the park. And I know that these in-person activities are not available to everyone. But thankfully, because of the pandemic, there are now many opportunities to engage in these types of activities remotely as well. So I know of yoga studios doing classes online and other exercise platforms that allow you to work out with a group socially, but from your home. Volunteering helps people feel better by helping others. It also broadens your network and makes you feel more social support. So there are cancer-specific opportunities through nonprofit organizations. Immerman Angels and Living Beyond Breast Cancer both have programs where you can provide one-on-one -on -one support to others who've been diagnosed with cancer. You can also look for opportunities at local organizations like a food bank, and then you might even check with your healthcare facility to see if they have opportunities to volunteer. Maybe they can use somebody to greet people when they walk in the front door or to visit patients. 
Another way to stay connected is to make it a point to stay in touch with family, friends, and neighbors. We all get so busy with the many demands of life that you might think about calling someone, but then you forget to do it. So a way to keep track of that is to put it in your calendar or make it a goal to call a certain number of people per week or per day. This is gonna help you stay connected. And then if it's right for you, you could also consider adopting a pet. Animals can be a source of comfort and may also lower stress and blood pressure. There are also many formal opportunities out there to become a part of a group as well. So there may be support groups available. You can check with your treatment center, look online, or even in the community for support groups that are based on your diagnosis. Your local library is also likely to have some community programming. Your municipality or your county government may have opportunities available as well. I know that mine has everything from fitness to gardening to group movie night. The YMCA is a good place to look both for exercise options and community programming. And then if you're a member of a religious organization, they may also have programming opportunities. Formal groups like Girl Scouts, Rotary, the PTA are all opportunities to engage. And there are some health insurance companies that are now providing coverage um, for companionship, especially if you're someone who's unable to get out. There are also specific programs designed for older adults. So to find those, you can check with a local senior center or your city for senior programming. You can also search AARP's website or check with your local area agency on aging. Another aspect of community and social context is civic participation. And civic participation is engaging in any individual or group activity, addressing issues of public concern. So the goal of civic participation is to benefit a group or society as a whole. But taking part in these activities also positively impacts the health of the person taking the action. It helps us feel like we're a part of something bigger improving your sense of belonging. When you're involved in one group or activity, you're also more likely to find out about others that exist. You're also more likely to find a sense of purpose propelling you to engage in other similar activities. Some of the things I just talked about are actually forms of civic participation, like volunteering, becoming a member of a group or a club, Many formal and informal groups also engage in charitable activities that actually directly benefit health research. Things like the Ice Bucket Challenge and um, Susan G. Coleman Race for the Cure. Community gardening is also a really great example of civic participation that has a ton of positive outcomes. So it helps people take pride in their neighborhood and creates a better sense of community. It motivates members to get more involved in community life, and it gives access to healthy food. There are also ways to get involved with policy and legislative advocacy as well. For many, the idea of legislative advocacy is really overwhelming, but it doesn't have to be complicated. You can advocate on your own by doing things like reaching out to your local representative, or attending meetings for your city or neighborhood council. You can also share information with your network to raise awareness about issues that are important to you. There are also organizations that you can join to work on their advocacy efforts. We did a uh, hour long webinar last summer on how to be an effective advocate and it gave really good practical tips to follow. You can also see that on our website. The simplest way to get involved is actually just to vote. All right, so the last category of social determinants of health that I'm gonna talk about today 
is economic security. And this category really impacts every other category we talked about. So economic stability is about having stable, sufficient income to meet your basic needs, meaning that you have enough income to cover things like housing, nutritious food, clothing, transportation, and anything else that you need to live a healthy life. An individual's or family's economic stability is often tied to their employment status. So do they have a job? Is that job stable? Economic security is also impacted by things like food insecurity. If you don't have enough to eat, you struggle to do all the other things you need to do because you don't have the energy to work or learn or process. This also impacts the ability to stay employed or access education. Economic stability or security is also impacted by housing insecurity, which may be caused by economic instability, but also contributes to it. Without an address, it can be very difficult to get a job or qualify for government benefits. And then, of course, poverty is a factor associated with economic stability. And when we talk about poverty, we're talking about the more than one in 10 people who live at or below 100% of poverty as defined by the government. For a family of one, that's an income of $14,580 per year, or $30,000 for a family of four. And nearly half of those who are living in poverty are actually living in what's referred to as deep poverty, which is below 50% of the poverty level. Living in poverty impacts all of the other social determinants of health. People who live in poverty tend to live in concentrated areas, and poverty often lasts a long time. We also know that kids who grow up in poverty are more likely to live in poverty as adults than those who were never poor as kids. Food insecurity is an economic and social condition where an individual or family has limited or uncertain access to adequate food. So in 2020, 13.8 million households sorry, were food insecure at some point during the year. Food insecurity doesn't necessarily cause people to have hunger, but hunger is a possible outcome of food insecurity. And food insecurity can be long-term or it can be temporary. And it can be caused by things like lack of income, employment, by race or ethnicity, and disability. The risk of security increases when money to buy food is limited or not available. Adults who are living with a disability may be at higher risk for food insecurity because their disability might impact their employment and their employment opportunities. They may also have more healthcare related expenses that reduce the income available to buy food. There are also racial and ethnic disparities related to food insecurity. So in 2020, black non-Hispanic households were over two times more likely to be food insecure than the national average. And 17% of Hispanic households had food insecurity compared to the national average of 10%. And this is because of something like neighborhood conditions, physical access to food, and a lack of transportation. There are areas which are known as food deserts, and that's where communities um, have no or little access to affordable, healthy food. So food deserts occur more often in Black, Hispanic, and low-income neighborhoods where there are fewer full-scale supermarkets and more of the convenience stores and fast food options. There are also food deserts in rural areas where there's long distances between homes and supermarkets. Transportation concerns just compound these issues to accessing affordable, healthy food. A 
study in Detroit found that people living in low income, predominantly black neighborhoods, travel an average of 1.1 miles further to the closest supermarket than people living in low income, predominantly white neighborhoods. Adults who are viewed insecure may be at increased risk for a variety of negative health outcomes and health disparities. They're at increased risk for obesity, they have higher rates of chronic disease, more mental health concerns, and food insecure children may be at risk of developmental problems. Almost one out of five cases of cancer are related to dietary behaviors and excess body weight, especially colorectal, liver, and pancreatic cancer. And the cases of those cancers are not equally distributed through the population. So African-American men are at a higher risk of developing each of those cancers, and Native American and Hispanic men have a higher risk of developing To combat food insecurity, there are programs that can be put into place to help. So studies show that cash incentives to buy fruit and vegetables can lead to a 20% increase in consumption of fruits and vegetables over a one-year period. And it's projected that such a nationwide program would prevent about 5,000 new cancer cases each year in the U.S. And that would be uh, especially helpful for populations affected by health inequity. Increased funding for the Farm Bill would support production and access to healthy food. And there is also a lot of food waste in our country. That food waste could be donated to increase the availability of those foods in areas where there is lacking. So that keeps food out of the garbage and puts it into the hands of people who need it. You know that there are some grocery stores and restaurants that have started doing this in recent years, but others really need to be encouraged to join them. There are some programs that provide food security already in place. So if you or someone you know is hungry right now, there is actually a hunger hotline that exists. And that can help you find access to food in your community. And then there are also organizations like Feeding America, which can provide information on how to find food locally. There's also the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. That's also known as SNAP or food stamps. And that helps people by giving them a monthly allotment that they can use to get access to nutritious food. There's also the WIC program, which is specifically for women and children. And then there are programs specifically for children to provide meals at school or child care centers and for seniors to get access to nutritious food at home. And these programs can help make sure that people are getting access to the food that they need. Other ideas for finding food if you're feeling food insecure or you know someone who is. United Way 211 program is a hot resource hotline. Um, they can help you locate local resources. To access them, you call 211 or you go to 211.org online. And they can help you find food banks, food pantries, and soup kitchens. There are also programs that deliver um, meals to homes, like Meals on Wheels. There's a virtual food bank called Full Cart. And then because of this link between food insecurity and health, some insurance providers or health insurance providers are actually providing delivery or grocery vouchers so that you can get food through your health insurance. company. So it might be worth checking with them as well. All right, so transportation is another important factor that impacts many aspects of an individual's health and well-being. And that's everything from accessing healthcare services 
and healthy food options to maintaining social connections and maintaining employment. About 8.6% of households in the US have no vehicle. And a lack of transportation is actually the leading cause of patient no-shows for medical appointments. Missed medical appointments lead to increased medical care costs for the patient, delays in care, and more emergency room visits. Individuals who have to rely on public transportation are limited to the routes that are available. And often they don't reach the communities who need them most. I told you how engaging in social wellness and civic activities can help people keep stay connected, them off isolation and loneliness. Yet doing so often requires traveling outside of one's home. And for those who don't have transportation, and those who are aging or living with disabilities, public transportation plays a key role in improving their access to their community. Public transportation services, especially in rural areas, may be a literal lifeline for individuals who have no other means of moving about their community. And where public transportation is available, it's sometimes crowded, dirty, and unsafe. Those are hazards for anyone, but especially someone who's in cancer treatment. Routes can be long and they can require several transfers. So that might take something like a 15 minute drive and turn it into an hour plus bus ride. We really need to improve our infrastructure around public transportation and also provide more access to alternative methods, things like bike lanes and sidewalks. That will help people get where they need to be and boost population health. Now, this is actually a really great opportunity to engage in civic participation. So to improve the infrastructure, legislators need to be willing to make those changes. And you can reach out to them to advocate for these improvements. You can also check around to see if there are any local groups that are already doing that and join them. For individuals who are struggling with transportation and need help, there are some services available to help with specific situations. So keep in mind these are not going to be available in all areas of the country, but they are worth looking into. So you need a ride to a doctor's appointment to check um, you should check with your insurance provider. Uh, Medicaid typically provides transportation to and from appointments, and many Medicare Advantage plans also offer that resource. If you don't have Medicaid or Medicare Advantage, the American Cancer Society offers rides to appointments in some areas of the country, and that's through their Road to Recovery program. The link is on the slide. United Ways 211 Ride United is also a helpful resource. Um, and they can actually give you a ride not only to a medical appointment, but also to other places you need to go, like work or the grocery store. You can call 211 to find out more about that. And then Lyft, the ride sharing app, actually has a job access program that helps people get to job interviews. And DAV will also help veterans who need transportation. Now, I want you to remember that you're not going to be able to access these programs last minute. You have to check into them in advance and ensure that you are scheduling your ride before the cutoff time so that you get to be where you need to go. If you live outside of the service area for these programs or you don't qualify for them, but you need help with a ride, you can try and do things like see if you can carpool with somebody to get where you need to go. Or maybe you can crowdsource a ride. Many people are willing to help out. They just don't know how. And this can give them the opportunity. I've mentioned some of the government-sponsored benefits that are available to individuals, things like Medicaid and SNAP. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about cash 
benefits that you may be able to access through the government and some other programs that exist to help reduce these financial burdens. So one cash benefit that exists at the federal level is temporary assistance to needy families, also known as TANF or cash assistance. And that's where families are getting access to cash benefits to pay for expenses. The program is administered by local social service offices. So the, that's a good place to go and check and find out more about the program. Also important to realize that many of the government benefits are actually tied together. So if you qualify for SNAP benefits, you might also get TANF automatically, or at least be able to apply for it on the same application. There are two federal disability insurance programs that provide a monthly payment. Both of them are, are administered by the Social Security Administration, or SSA. And they're, those two programs are called Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI, and Supplemental Security Income, SSI. So many S's, they don't make it easy for us to keep it straight. Both of those are long-term programs and they have a really high standard of disability. Social Security defines disability as a medical condition that's expected to last one year or longer, that keeps you from working, and not just your current job, but any job that you've had for the last 15 years. Now, even though this is another federal program, it's run through the State Disability Determination Service, And that creates a situation where sometimes you can get different answers to questions when you're calling for information about two different states. And because of that, you wanna make sure that you are actually getting information from the source and not relying about on what friends or family member told you about the program. Because some of this information is gonna be based on where you live and your specific situation. So the definition and who runs the program are the only things that are the same about these programs. There are lots of differences between SSI and SSDI. SSI is based on having a low income and low resource level and that you have a disability. The maximum payment in 2023 for SSI is $914 a month, so it's not a ton of money. But most states add a supplemental payment to make it a little better. It's also good to be aware that the application process can take a long time. And that's gonna be because Social Security is backed up, right? So even though you might not have a huge payment, you might get a bigger check when you get that first check because of back payment. SSI is also available for children. And their income and resources are gonna be based on the household income and resources. This is actually really useful for families when a parent has to stop working because they need to now be a caregiver for a child who has a disability. The other program is SSDI, and that's not based on your income level, based on your work history, and that you've paid into Social Security, to, uh, the retirement system. And you have to have done that recently. Um, it's also important to know about SSDI is that there's a five month waiting period before you can actually get cash benefits from SSDI. And there's no exception to that rule other than for ALS. You may be able to get SSI if um, you happen to qualify for that during the period while you're waiting for SSDI. And if this is the first time that you're hearing about SSDI and you've been out of work for a while, you may also be able to get retroactive payment, which is good. We have a ton of resources related to disability insurance on our website. So we've got quick guides. We also have a module on cancer finances and disability insurance. 
And we have a whole recorded webinar on our website that goes in depth on this information. Those are a great place to point patients to or to watch yourself if you're interested in applying for one of those programs. We also know that caregivers need to take time off work. And the reality is that most of us can't go without working for extended periods of time without some sort of income. So there are a handful of states that provide state paid leave for caregivers, which is really helpful for someone who needs to replace those lost wages. But if you're not in one of those states and you don't qualify for paid leave, there's also a Medicaid program um, which is not going to be the same in every state, because remember, Medicaid is state specific. But if somebody qualifies for Medicaid, they might be able to qualify for in-home support services, where a family member can actually get paid to provide in-home support. A good place to start to look for this information is on our uh, state resources page. Vets who need personal care services or assistance might be able to get access through the veteran directed care program as well. And that's where a vet's given a budget for services and then they can hire workers to meet their needs. Now, there are some other programs that I think are really useful to know about when thinking about uh, financial assistance. So there are utilities assistance programs, including the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program or LIHEAP, which is for heating and cooling costs and the Low Income House That Hold Water Assistance Program. Um, often with these programs, there's a set amount of money that's allocated to them. Once that money's gone, it's gone. So if you want to apply, try to apply early in the season. And then there are federal programs that provide phone and internet assistance as well. There's a Lifeline program, which provides phone service. You can apply for that at lifelinesupport.org. And then there's also the Affordable Connectivity Program, which is run by the Federal Communications Commission, or the FCC, which offers broadband internet for low-income households. It also can give you a one-time discount to buy equipment to access the internet. These programs and other sources of financial assistance are listed on our checklist for finding financial help. I find it really useful when I'm trying to think through what options are out there for people um, to go through this list. In addition to those public benefits resources I talked about, it includes information about looking for help from nonprofits, foundations, and other private sources. I think it's a great way to double check that you've explored all of the available avenues for financial help. And remember that you need to be creative with financial assistance that you get. If you have a certain amount allocated for food, but now you're eligible for SNAP, shift that money to pay for other bills. Our toolkit website, cancerfinances.org, is a resource that provides practical information on topics that can impact your finances. It's designed to guide you to the information that's most relevant to your situation and connect you to financial assistance resources. There are also many topics that I've referred to throughout my talk today, and we frequently add topics and update this information on the site. Now, when we're thinking about the social determinants of health, we're thinking about how to catch more people upstream, about how to prevent poor health outcomes and try to catch people before they fall in. But we also know that some health issues are gonna occur regardless. In which case, I think we should be focusing on decreasing the negative impact from these upstream factors so that the individuals are able to have a quick and easy recovery. So remember that the goal is to achieve health equity and give everyone the chance to be the healthiest they can be. All right, so I know that my um, colleagues have been answering some of the questions that are coming up in the Q&A. And I am going to let them continue to do that while I talk through a few other things. So if you're interested in learning more about today's topics or other ones, we invite you to attend our free triage cancer conference. Those are gonna be one day events that are open to anyone. 
We cover key information on how to navigate practical issues, minimize the financial burden of a cancer diagnosis, and reduce your stress. Um, we are going to be having our next conference on May 20th, and it will be virtual, so please join us. For healthcare professionals on today, we have an event that's designed just for you. Our insurance and finance intensive is a full day training that takes a deep dive into health and disability insurance, employment and finances, and it, it's so that you can help your patients better navigate these issues. There are free continuing education credits for professionals there. And as a reminder, if you have questions about your individual situation, you can also contact our free legal and financial navigation program. We also hope you found this presentation to be useful and that you'll continue to stay connected with us. We invite you to attend more webinars. We also encourage you to sign up to receive our blog. You can use that QR code to get it delivered to your email. And you can connect with us on social media at Triage Camp. And for healthcare professionals on today, you can also order materials and we will ship them to you for free. And as a last reminder, to get continuing education credit for today's webinar, you have to have stayed until the end. You're gonna receive an email following the webinar from Zoom, which contains a link to the evaluation and the post-test. The post-test is going to require your name and your email address so that we can certify that you actually completed the evaluation. That's the email that we're going to use to send the certificate within four weeks. Please complete the evaluation and the post-test within one week of today. You must receive a passing grade on the post-test. If you see this message once you've completed the evaluation and the post-test, your submission has been logged and you passed the post-test. If you receive a score that's less than 80%, you will see this message. It includes the link to retake the post-test. You can copy and paste that link into your web browser. You do not need to resubmit the evaluation. We thank you for attending today. We hope you found this information useful, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.